So the first question we ask ourselves is where geographically in South Africa is the high felt located? So in a broad sense, as you'll see by this graphic here, the high felt region is largely this um, area marked in green located in central South Africa. So you can see it's a fairly def well-defined geographical region and it generally occurs south of the Michalisburg region. So that's that line up on the northern edges. The, it doesn't extend beyond the Great Escarpment or the Drakensberg Escarpment Mountain. That's the line in red that follows down the right-hand side. And um, it doesn't extend into the high alpine habitats of the Lesotho Mountains, which is shown in pink over here. So you can very roughly see it's broadly located in central South Africa, and it occupies a fairly wide area, east of Joburg, west of Joburg, and south of Joburg. So the second question we now ask ourselves is, what constitutes high felt? What makes it high felt? What are the key characteristics that we look for in this region? So, as you can roughly see in this photograph, the high felt region is largely described as being a predominantly open environment where less than 10% of, of the habitat is um, wooded. So it's primarily an open grassy environment, less than 10% treed. And then it's also defined as being on a sort of a, a high altitude plateau above 1,000 meters and below two and a half thousand meters. So we're not in the Alpine mountains above two and a half thousand meters, and we're not in the lower lying bushveld regions that are below a thousand meters. And now the third question we ask ourselves, so we've excluded the, the lush subtropical coastal forests of Zululand, and we've excluded the bushveld. So, Surely the birding can't be any good in this open grassy plain of central South Africa. But the question, uh, the answer couldn't be further from the truth. And in this little pictograph over here, you can see a number of some of these high felt specials that can be found in the high felt. So we have three of our endemic and near endemic species. We have our national bird, the blue crane in the bottom right corner. Here you can see an adult bird with its two nearly grown chicks peeking up above the grass. We then also have southern bald ibis in the top left corner white bellied busted in the top center. And then uh, we have the really scarce and localized and nomadic cuckoo finch up in the top right corner. This is a bird that's very unpredictable, very difficult to find, and is arguably easiest found up on this high felt plateau. And then of course we have the regal secretary bird in the bottom left, which are at home on these open grassy plains. And we now have another pictograph just to show you all that I'm not leading you down the garden path. So here we have um, multiple birders all looking at and enjoying uh, various birds on the high felt and one very happy birder enjoying birds on the high felt. So as we run through this talk, we're going to look at some of these micro habitats that effectively make up the broader high felt region. So we're going to very briefly discuss a little bit about these habitat types. We're going to look at a few birding sites that make up, um, that access these micro habitats. And then we're going to have a look at some of the species that you can see in these areas. So this first site is fairly self-explanatory, um, urban high felt. So we now know high felt is mostly open grassy area and urban largely being in the urban metropolis of um, Gauteng, Joburg and Pretoria. So fairly self-explanatory. So onto some of the sites that, we, um, that are best accessed, uh, or I should say give you best access to this urban high felt region. Number one is the Rickflay Nature Reserve in Pretoria. So this site generally needs no introduction and I'm sure many of us are familiar with it. A really just general superb high felt reserve, nice open grassy plains, lots of birds, lots of animals, a really good day out. Secondly is the Klipperfiesberg Nature Reserve in Southern Johannesburg. Another really excellent high felt reserve. Access is free and safe and it's mostly by walking trails. So really good for those of you that wanna get out and. Um, have a little bit of exercise as well. Another really, truly excellent urban high felt reserve. And lastly, I've used a bit of my creative license in adding in the Walter Sisulu Botanical Gardens. As um, while there is a small high felt component um, located sort of on the very eastern side of the gardens, the bulk of the gardens is obviously made up with a large river that runs through that's typically quite lush and well wooded. So I've used a little bit of creative license in adding the site, but it's another truly excellent urban reserve that does give you a lot of these really good high felt species. So we're now gonna have a look at some of the species that 
can be found in these urban reserves. And first and foremost, we have a look at is long-tailed widow bird. This is a species that's um, very close to me personally. It wasn't always the case. It's something that has developed as I've um, gone about my career as an international birding guide. So, you know, this is a very common species and they're very common place in these open grasslands. You see them flying around on the highway as we driving to places and many people dismiss them as being common and fairly boring. However, showing this bird to international birders, their jaws always virtually hit the ground um, almost every time they see the species. And that has really changed my perception on this bird. You know, it's, it's a big, bold bird with a really long tail prominent white and red patches on the wing and a really blindingly white beak as well. And it occurs in an entirely open environment. So this is a combo that's really rare in the, in the natural world. Generally, all these very big bold birds are typically in the deep, dark forests, very difficult to see. So to have this really spectacular bold bird in such an open environment, excellent views are pretty much guaranteed, is really quite special. And every time I see this bird, it brings me such a great sense of euphoria. Um, so I really do enjoy these um, more widespread common species. Secondly, we have a look at Cape Longclaw. This is one of our um, grassland endemics to southern uh, species that's restricted to southern Africa. They are at home in the Highfold region and they are quite common and quite obvious. Another really cool species. We then also have Northern Black Koran. This is one of the more sought after birds in these urban high felt reserves. Ritfly nature reserves are a really good place to see them. Um, they occur on the big open grassy plains, a lot more easier to see in the summer when the males are sitting calling um, from their exposed perches, much like this. And then another one of our more widespread species in these urban um, reserves is the Swainson spurfowl. So again, they are quite obvious, quite common. And um, I, uh, I have, uh, yes, I was going to make a little joke um, about this bird. Um, my good friend, Lance Robinson, I don't, I don't see him in the audience over here, but he is around here today, but he does a really good rendition of this bird's call. So if you guys happen to see Lance at any stage during the day, please ask him to do his Swainson Spurfeld rendition, and you can say Dylan sent you. And then purely because we've also included the botanical gardens, Barrow's eagles are, of course, the staple over there, and they've been nesting in, that, um, in the botanical gardens for many, many years, longer than I've been alive. Um, so that's a pride and prize special of that reserve. So the second key habitat type that we look at on this high felt plateau is wetlands. So now we know that the high felt occurs on a relatively high altitudinal region. So it's above 1,000 meters, below 2,500 meters, so we're fairly high in elevation and we are on this big central plateau of South Africa. So many of our smaller rivers and streams actually have their sources up here on the high felt. And it's generally quite a wet area. There's a lot of rainfall during the summer months. And that leads to a lot of dams, rivers and wetlands very widely spread throughout this entire region. And wetlands are actually a really key component of high felt birding. So we're now gonna have a look at some of the sites that give you the best access to wetlands around here. And I must just say, um, all the sites that we're going to look at are only um, a very few, um, a very small percentage of the actual sites that exist in this wider Gauteng region. There, are, of course, are many, many more um, sites around that give you access to all these habitat types. First and foremost, on the wetland front is Maribel Bird Sanctuary near Nigel. The site, again, shouldn't need much of an introduction. It's one of South Africa's premier birding um, destinations, very well set up for birders. There's an excellent network of hides, uh, very well placed um, sort of perches, wonderful for photographers, really, really just general superb place, a lot of excellent birding. You can't go wrong with a visit to Maribel. Secondly, we have the East Rand Pans in the sort of greater Benoni and Boxburg region. This site is a little bit less formal as it's largely, largely just pans located in a very informal setting, sort of in suburbia accessed either via walking around the pans or via public parks. So it's not as well dedicated to birders, but they have a very good selection of um, wetland species from the Highfeld region. And then lastly is a site that most folks will likely not be familiar with, and it's the Tsukani Pans closer to Heidelberg, so that's south of Johannesburg. This is again a, a network of pans located in rural uh, farmland areas, and they are extremely excellent. They support a wide range of all the Highfeld species, including a lot of really difficult and tough species that are not easy elsewhere in the city. 
So firstly, we have a look at white-faced whistling ducks. The species uh, are a bit nomadic and they move around, but they generally occur and can be seen at most of the wetland sites within the Highfeld region. Secondly is Goliath heron. Um, again, the species most of us will be familiar with, a really, really giant heron. And this particular um, bird has got a particularly giant fish as well. Um, I was going to try offer an ID as to the fish, but I actually have no idea. So clearly my bird ID is better than my fish ID. But a significant proportion of all of South Africa's Goliath herons actually occur in the wetlands of the High Felt region. Lesser flamingos are another one of the special species that occur up here, perhaps not as common as the greater flamingos, which are usually more numerous up on this high felt region. Lesser flamingos do tend to move into the region in the winter months when the uh, water levels typically drop and become a little bit more saline. This is key for the species. So we now also have red chested flufftail. While these birds are mega shy, and some of us may have been fortunate enough to see flufftails out there, um, the high felt is a really good place for red chested flufftails. They do very well in the wetlands up here, and even tiny wetlands, roughly five meters by five meters, with a bit of reeds, a bit of sedges, and some very shallow flooded water sort of available, will almost certainly have red chested flufftail. It doesn't mean you're going to see it, they are still very difficult to see, but they occur very widely and even in the tiniest of wetlands around the Gauteng region. Black heron are another one of our cool species that occur in the wetland region up here. Um, the species perhaps is more common in the subtropical wetlands in lower lying areas, but they still occur quite widely across the high felt. And then we also have ruff. So ruff is one of our most common shorebirds in South Africa and especially in this high felt region. So um, it's a species that uh, birders should typically try and become quite familiar with as they are quite numerous and then you can start picking through all the the roughs to look for some of those scarcer and more sought after species and lastly we also look at marsh owl this is a species that is also really at home up on the high felt with a combination of open grassy areas and wetlands typically catering very well for the species um, they, they occur quite widely and you can also get them in a lot of urban sites um, quite remarkably um, as a matter of fact, there's a wetland very close to where I live in southern Johannesburg, where in the winter, sometimes up to 20 marsh owls uh, roost at this wetland. And if you go there in the late evening, it's a really special sight, if you, as you have 20 of these owls all quartering around and flying over this wetland. And this is all right on the doorstep of Johannesburg. So truly, truly special. So the next um, zone that we're going to have a look at in the high felt is this upland montane grassland. So this arguably makes up the bulk of the high felt habitat, especially to the south and to the east of Johannesburg. Um, very, very widespread, not too much specific um, about it. It's kind of just grassland, typically between knee high and waist high. Um, and then obviously up on this high altitude plateau. So not an awful lot distinct about it, but this habitat type houses the bulk of our endemic species in South Africa. The high felt is obviously a unique habitat type. It occurs nowhere else in the world and hence it supports a lot of restricted species that you can't get anywhere else in the world. So this habitat type is really key and important for birders and especially international birders. Many of them come to South Africa purely to see all of our grassland endemic species. And this upland montane grassland is arguably the place to see these birds. So there are perhaps more famous birding sites um, in this upland grassland that are not really within easy striking distance of Gauteng, like Vakestrum and Dalstrom. Those are arguably more suited to weekend destinations away. But some of our easy day trip um, and, and half day trip places available close to Johannesburg and Pretoria is firstly the Devon grasslands out east of Johannesburg. So now I must also just mention that the bulk of our grassland habitat is also very good for agriculture. So we have very little or very few tracts of totally pristine grassland that are untouched. The, the bulk of it is largely mixed agricultural habitat with tracts of grassland that is still pristine, but it's quite a bit of a mix of habitat that still persists. So this is true with all these sites that we're going to have a look at. The Devon grasslands also is a mix of agricultural farmland and then really good productive tracts of high felt grassland. Secondly is the grasslands around Broncos Break Dam. This is more east of Pretoria. Again, really, really superb birding destination, supporting a lot of really good endemics. Sadly, much of the land here is private, so you typically have to have access into some of the private farms that have these big tracts of grassland. 
but the access can be arranged and supports a really good network of birds. And then lastly, we have the Plucklachter grasslands around Ekandustria. So this is up now north of Bronkospreit. So all these sites are largely in a line north to south, east of Joburg and Pretoria. And then the further east and the further south you go from this, um, the habitat remains the same and you can see all these same species as well. So firstly, um, one of our key species in this habitat type is the blue crane. Now, as we touched on um, a little earlier, this is South Africa's national bird, and it's a species that um, need open grassland habitat. They're not very common around the very close to Gauteng. You typically, um, they're on the edges of their range here, and the further east and the further south you go, the more common they become. But the Devon grasslands in particular are a really good site for the species, especially during the winter months when the birds congregate in their non-breeding season. And sometimes there's flocks of up to 200 blue cranes that roam these grasslands. Very special again on the edges of Gauteng. Secondly is a species we all love and are familiar with, um, the summer visiting Ammo falcon. So these birds are very interesting coming from sort of Eastern Asia, roughly China, Northern India, Mongolia, that rough region. So they come from a very, very long way away. They typically arrive in the region in December and depart in March. It's a species that sadly isn't doing too well as well. They have a few threats um, on their breeding grounds and en route to their breeding grounds that have impacted them. So we're not seeing them in the huge numbers that we're used to anymore, but they are still a pride um, feature of our grasslands of this montane plateau. We then also have cuckoo finch, another species we looked at a little earlier in the talk. So this is a species that I always have mixed feelings about. Number one, they are a very difficult species to find. So whenever you see it, it's a truly exciting moment. It's not a bird you see frequently or regularly. So it's always quite exciting to see this bird, but they are a brood parasite. So that means they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And in this case, it's the poor, tiny, hapless cysticulars. So I'm always have slightly mixed feelings when you see this cuckoo finch. Um, but this high fault region is arguably the best place in the entire world for cuckoo finch. Again, they're not really easy anywhere. You can see them pretty widely anywhere in the high fault, but it's arguably your best chances of finding this bird. And one of our ultimate grassland endemics is the blue Quran. So this is one of the chief birds that most international birders actually come to South Africa to see as one of our um, sort of feature grassland species. They are right on the edges of their range in the Gauteng area, but the Devon area and the grasslands around Broncos Freight Dam are really good for blue Quran. And again, the further south and east you go, the more widespread they become. So touching, well, touching base on the cuckoo finch we just looked at, here's, your, here's our pale crown cysticula. So this species is one of the ones that the cuckoo finch uh, parasitize, they target for their um, egg laying antics. Unfortunately, this is one of our really scarce cysticulas. They, they need really specialized micro habitats within this upland grassland. They're not very common, but again, the Bronchosprate region and the Devon grasslands are all pretty good to find pale crown cysticula. And then secretary birds as well are at home on these grassland plateaus. Typically, there are enough um, small scattered bushes and trees for them to nest and breed in, but these birds range very widely across this grassland region, and you can actually find them anywhere. Red Flame Nature Reserve as well in Pretoria is another close urban site for them, as are uh, several others. But the Devon grasslands as well, in particular, are really important for the species. Like the cranes, they actually seem to congregate during the winter months in, in high numbers. They, they often gather in these almost communal roosts in the evenings, up to 20 secretary birds gathering in a field kind of as the late afternoon settles. And then they'll sort of spend their night together and disperse in the morning, roaming around the plains looking for their food. So another habitat type that is really key for this high felt region is mountains and rocky outcrops and scree slopes. So just like wetlands are a key component of the high felt, as are mountains. So they are very widely spread throughout the high felt, occurring in all the different corners out on the west, to the east, to the south. Mountains are another really key component of, these, of this high felt region. And some of the key sites that access mountainous regions is the Saker Borsrand Nature Reserve um, near Heidelberg. This is again south of Johannesburg. Like Marivelle Bird Sanctuary, this is one of our premier birding destinations in South Africa. Really, really excellent site, one of my all-time favorites. I spend a lot of my time at Saker Borsrand and have recorded nearly 250 birds within the reserve alone. Just testament to the supreme birding that can be had um, in that single reserve alone. 
Secondly is the Kreilingstadt Mountain. This is again in the Balfour district, southeast of um, Johannesburg. It's effectively a part of a bigger chain of mountains that stretches almost towards Standerton um, and then runs from about Heidelberg. Kreilingstadt is a really good place to access this chain of mountains and it supports um, the full network of these mountain species. And lastly, we have a look at Renostokop. So this is a really big, almost monolithic mountain that occurs north of Bronkospreit. Largely an outlier is that, in that it's just one giant mega hill that sort of stands sentinel over the whole uh, valley. Um, but it supports a really good network of rocky habitat and a lot of these um, rocky mountain species. So firstly, we have a look at sentinel rock thrush. This is a winter visitor from the Lesotho Highlands where they escape from the really harsh winters that Lesotho has to the slightly milder winters that we have on the Highfeld Plateau. So the species typically only occurs during the winter months and they uh, can be quite common at places like Sakerbosrunt. Grey-winged Franklin is one of our special endemic Franklins to Southern Africa. The species is a through and through mountain special. They need um, mountainous regions. In our region, they're very localized, only occurring around Sakerbosrunt and Hrelingstadt in sadly uh, quite limited densities. But the further south and east you go, like to places around Vakastrium, for example, they can actually be quite numerous in these more rocky mountainous habitats. Another one of these core specials is Eastern Longworld Lark. This is another, this is one of our typical birders LBJs, little brown jobs for those that may not know. Very indistinct bird, not much markings, doesn't really look like anything. It's called, doesn't really sound like too much. Typical LBJ, but this species is very um, restrictive in that it almost exclusively only occurs in rocky areas high, at high altitude. So it's one of the few species that has this requirement. And Sakerbos Ranch in particular is a really good place to try and search for Eastern Longbold Lark. I must also know, some of us may remember back in the day when um, the many longboard lark species that we have now were just formerly one longboard lark with different populations around Southern Africa. So Eastern longboard lark, as it is now known, doesn't have a very long beak, as some of you may be thinking. Some of the species that occur out on the west, like Cape longboard lark and Agullus longboard lark, have the truly long beaks. They are almost hoopoo-sized long beaks, really, really long, massively decurved beaks. The eastern component of the species, unfortunately, doesn't quite have that. Buff Street Chat is another one of our really attractive and special mountainous endemics. It's a species that is also right on the edge of its range, um, close to Johannesburg, and it only can really be found on the Renostokop mountain. Um, but the further south and the further east you go, the more widespread they become. Um, but it's also a testament to another how attractive all these mountainous birds are. Cape bunting is one of our more widespread seed eaters that occur in this mountainous region. They are quite common in can occur in quite high densities at, at all of these mountainous sites. And jackal buzzard is our um, mountain endemic raptor. Now, obviously, raptors range quite widely in their search for food, but jackal buzzards require mountains to breed, and the mountainous regions like Sakerbos Ryan is always a good starting point in trying to find this bird. So we now move on to moist grasslands. So I've used a little bit more creative license in naming this site as this is effectively a very specialized type of montane grassland, but the name like lush rolling grassy hills with very short vegetation doesn't quite roll off the tongue. So this habitat type is very localized, typically occurring up northeast of Pretoria in the rough region north of Bronkospreit and up towards Middleburg. Very, very specialized region that it supports a really excellent network of very difficult species. Um, so this site, this area and habitat type was effectively put on the map only in more recent years over the last decade or so, with the finding of several really exciting and rare species that we're going to have a look at shortly. So the, the first site that we're going to have a look at that accesses these more moist grasslands is the Verena grasslands. So it's a, effectively a network of gravel roads that occur around the small rural village of Verena. Um, truly one of the most underrated birding sites in all of South Africa. I really wish the site receives much more attention, supports an excellent network of rare species, and um, it just is such, such superb birding in this region. One of my all-time favorites. Secondly, are the grasslands around Ezemvelo Nature Reserve and the surrounding area. They also are likewise really good and support a good network of um, these prized species that we're after. And lastly, are the grasslands in the Loskop Dam Nature Reserve. 
So this is arguably on the edge of our easily accessible day trip uh, venues from Johannesburg and Pretoria. They are slightly an hour and a half or so away, so it's getting towards the limit of what's easily doable in a single day. Um, but the Lost Corp Dam Nature Reserve near Middleburg is also a really good habitat um, and place to explore this habitat type, I should say. So firstly, we have a look at white-bellied bustard. So this is one of South Africa's near endemic species, really sought after and scarce bird that aren't common anywhere, except in this region. They occur in this region in really high densities, so much so that when you arrive in um, the mornings, uh, one family group of white-bellied bustards will begin calling and seven or eight surrounding families will all start answering each other simultaneously. And you just have this incredible uh, array of white-bellied bustards all croaking around you in the morning really very special. The species occurs in this region, such high densities, it's almost frightening. Like its long-tailed woodabird cousin that we had a look at earlier, red-collared woodabird also has a soft spot in my heart and they occur quite commonly and flutter over these grasslands during the summer months. And red-winged Franklin is one of the special birds that occur in these um, rolling hills here. They're a very shy bird, not easy to see. You have to largely try and time your visit in the spring, early summer months when the grass and vegetation is all pretty short, um, in which case it just makes them slightly easier to find. And we're now going to have a look at um, the family that all birders tend to dread, larks. So larks are, again, major LBJs that many folks are a little bit afraid to try an ID. And South Africa is the lark capital of the world. To put that in perspective, the whole of North America has one regularly occurring lark, and in South Africa, we have more than 30 species. So that difference is pretty frightening. So the grasslands are a key component as to why we have so many larks. There's a lot of different larks that make their home in the grassland regions, arguably the most important of which is our near endemic melodious lark. It would be a true full South African endemic, if not for a small isolated population in southern Zimbabwe. But otherwise, the species is almost exclusively a high felt endemic. Very, very tough to find. And you only need a, you can only typically see the species in a very short window during the spring period when the birds are displaying much like this individual. They sit hovering above the, um, the grassland, not very high, maybe 10 meters above the grassland, calling away, which they'll do for hours on end. And they can be um, quite obvious during that period. But for the rest of the year, they are very inconspicuous, very difficult to find. Denham's bustard is another one of our core species to look at in this region. And another one of our typical LBJs is short-tailed pipit. So this is the species that effectively put this region on the map. This is a very rare, unknown, and very overlooked species. And when these birds were found in these uh, grasslands up northeast of Pretoria, it effectively put this, this region on the map and has forced birders to start exploring and spending a little bit more time there and many more of these other exciting species have been found in this region. So we're now gonna have a look at the Acacia Thornfelt region. So now some of you may, may be thinking, well, Thornfelt's not really high felt habitat. And yes, that is true. So we must just remember that high felt constitutes less than 10% of wooded vegetation. And in this broader region, the Thornfelt patches are typically linked to the mountains where they occur on the more shaded and secluded south facing slopes, much like this photo describes. So there are several thornfeld patches, most of which are, again are linked to the mountains. And first and foremost um, is the Sacred Bors Rand Nature Reserve south of Johannesburg. Secondly is the Klipper Fiesberg Nature Reserve, also in southern Joburg. So those are two sites that we've had a look at previously for other habitat types, but they also support really excellent patches of acacia thornfeld. And then lastly is the broader Eichenhof region, also on southern Johannesburg. So me as an Alberton boy living in southern Johannesburg, no way are any of these sites indicative of where I do all of my birding. So onto some of the species that we um, find in this region. First and foremost is crimson-breasted shrike. So this is a more typical Kalahari species that again just reaches its, um, the edge of its range here in the Gauteng area. And you can get them in these southern Gauteng thornfeld patches. Fairy flycatcher is a winter visitor from the high altitude plains of Lesotho. And swallowtail bee eater is another winter visitor to this region. They typically move in from the wider Karoo regions out west. Another one of our thornfeld specials that are, are quite common in this region is the Kalahari scrub robin. And we also have um, many colorful seed eaters that are at home in these thornfeld patches, like this green winged patilia. 
also to be seen are the brightly colorful violet eared and black faced wax balls. Blue wax balls can be found, several fire finches, and some of the widers like long tailed paradise and shaft tailed wider. They all occur in these southern Johannesburg thornfeld patches. The further west you go, dark cap bulbuls become replaced by African red eyed bulbuls, um, such as at Sekebos Runt. There's primarily African red eyed bulbuls. And the further west you go, we lose our familiar dark cap bulbuls and they're replaced with red eyes. And the same is largely true with um, the white eyes, with the Cape white eyes being replaced by Orange River white eyes the further south and west that you go. So we now move on to our last of our habitat types that we're going to have a look at, and this is the more arid grasslands. So this is the habitat type that's located primarily on the western side of the high felt, west of Johannesburg, and it's primarily arid as it has a strong influence from the Karoo. So this is a, a lot of these sites described here are going to be new to most of us, and um, they've only been put on the map again in fairly recent years. But number one is the Buens grasslands out on the west rand of Johannesburg. Truly superb, excellent um, um, site that supports a lot of these more arid thornfelt or arid high felt species, I should say. And then we also have the wider Val Dam and Heilbronn grasslands south of Johannesburg. And then we have the A Bailey Nature Reserve out in Coltonball. So all of these sites support an, a number of these more arid grassland species. First and foremost of them is Orange River Franklin. So this is a species that's exceedingly common in this area. Many, many covers e exist, and even the tiniest little patch of these arid grasslands can support um, vast numbers of these species. The species that uh, largely put this area on the map was the discovery of rufous yet warblers around Buens. Now, for those of you that may be familiar, this is a through and through Karoo bird. It's a species that you associate with waking up in a rocky mountain chalet in Beaufort West, where their thin, wispy calls uh, sort of float over the grassy plains in the early morning. So to have this species within the Gauteng province itself is nothing short of ridiculous. So it is a somewhat isolated population. They don't seem to occur too widely in our region. We have this population around the Buens area where they occur quite commonly, but then it's a gap of several hundred kilometers to get to the nearest population for the species. But this is a, a major species that we can find within the Gauteng area. Capped wheat here is one of our more common and widespread species. They are likewise are winter visitors from the Karoo where they typically come to Gauteng to breed before heading back to the Karoo habitats in the summer months. And then pink bald lark is one of our LBJs that are at home in this region. They are quite nomadic and they move around a lot depending on the habitat types and the burns, but they occur reliably in these more arid grasslands west of Joburg. Black Harrier is our handsome endemic raptor that is at home in this region, primarily during the winter months when they move up from the and more southern grasslands and the Karoo region as well. They occur quite widely, um, but are nowhere common in the area close to Johannesburg and Pretoria. We also have chestnut-backed sparrowlarks that are quite at home in this region. During very dry years, grey-backed sparrowlarks, its sister species, push in as well, and you often get the two species occurring together. So you need to have a careful eye in separating those two. And lastly, we have double-banded corsa. So this is a species many of you might not be aware actually occurs again on the right on the doorstep of Johannesburg and Gauteng province, primarily in the Val Dam rough region. So this is a site that's an, a more, like no more than an hour away from southern Johannesburg. Um, you can see the species that many of us associate with the very dry rocky plains of the Nama Desert and Itosha National Park a long distance away. So it's again a, a just testament to how diverse this high felt area is and how many different species you can actually find in this broader high felt region. So just a little bit of a um, selfless advertising over here. Um, Etienne Marais and Fancy Peacock have also roped me in to complete the revised edition, the Birding Gauteng 2, effectively, that's going to be coming out in the near future. So many of these sites that we have discussed, of course, of, will feature in this Birding Gauteng 2 book um, that's on its way. And um, there's been a full revision of the entire book. Um, this, is, this was a much loved and much um, sort of desired book with an update long overdue. And it's um, just truly great to be part of this incredible project um, with this update coming in the near future. So anyway, guys, I think we're on the edge of our time frame available. If anyone has a few questions, I think we might still have a moment or two before I'm chased off the um, table up here at the top. If anyone has questions, you're welcome to ask some now. Oh, yes, you say at the back. Maybe 
Um, so A Bailey access is uh, a bit tricky. So you typically have to arrange in advance. I was last in A Bailey last year, uh, towards the end of last year. Um, but I know there are several other um, birders within the Gauteng region that visited a bit more frequently. Some folks have been there a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago in June. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, it does have a few issues at A Bailey. One of them, like the fences being removed at the, the back side of the, the reserve that creates somewhat safety concerns, but it still presents really good um, habitat type for this region. Righty. Anyway, thanks for listening to the talk, guys. I really appreciate um, this, and I hope you all learned one or two new things and new places to go birding. Great. Thanks.